Continental powers Russia and China have challenged the world order. Bloomberg reports, both countries have a common goal redistribution of power and an end to American domination. Recent world events show that everything is going according to their plan. In hindsight, the last time Vladimir Putin visited Xi Jinping in China was just three weeks before troops were deployed to Ukraine. It was a moment of hubris and arrogance both leaders confidently declared their desire to make. A mess of the world built by the US and its allies. They succeeded, even if not everything went as planned. Sarah Payne, professor of history and national strategy at the US Naval Academy, says that to understand the behavior of China and Russia, one must understand their true nature, they are continental powers. In a world order, that four centuries has been consistently built by maritime powers, first Britain and then the United States. The difference is enormous. The maritime powers favor trade in principle, and to do so they have to get allies on their side and make international rules because they can get rich. The continental world order, on the other hand, is based on spheres of influence and implies territorial wars that destroy wealth and values. Ukraine is a prime example of this. Maritime powers also attack and subjugate other countries, as, for example, the US did in Iraq and the British Empire did in numerous colonies. They to break the rules when it suits them better, but their wars are expeditionary in nature, necessarily smaller in scale and fought abroad, and therefore more gentle on life and wealth. At home, these countries rarely seize territory for its own sake, emphasizing deterrence and regime change to serve their interests. They also prefer stable neighbors to shaky ones, because there is little bargaining power with failed states. Continental powers, on the other hand, are extremely sensitive about territory and seek to increase it, sometimes to the detriment of their own economies. Historically, continental powers are more likely to undermine their neighbors if the opportunity presents itself, either to absorb them later or to ensure that no powerful threat appears on their doorstep. This habitual paranoia, sometimes justified and sometimes self-fulfilling, also weakens their natural trading partners. That's exactly what Putin is doing right now in Ukraine, Payne says. In her book Wars for Asia, she cites destabilizing neighbors and then conquering and absorbing them as a successful method of the Russian Empire for centuries. She says a country can abandon the continental regime and join the maritime order, as the US has done. But change necessarily comes from within. Maritime powers tend to suffer much lower human losses. This was the case in World War II. China acts somewhat differently and, through large-scale exports, is consciously acquiring the qualities of a maritime power that Russia lacks. However, Xi and Putin are united by a force even more powerful than their geopolitical positions, the instinct for self-preservation. The Chinese Communist Party cannot afford to let Taiwan remain a coastal model of a successful democracy that also takes better care of its own population where the Han Chinese are still the majority. Putin could similarly allow Ukraine to become the model of European success that Ukrainians championed on the Maiden in 2014. These priorities for Putin and Xi Jinping are dangerous and therefore ruled out outright. They have already led to one conflict and could provoke a second. Both believe they are being squeezed by the West, holding back interests they consider vital to get their way. Xi and Putin willing to tolerate economic costs and suppress any domestic opposition. The result is a new kind of Cold War that will rally the continental powers of Eurasia, including China, Russia, Iran and North Korea against the US and its allies in Europe and Asia, including Australia, Japan, South Korea, the UK and most EU countries. Whether Putin shared details of his plans for Ukraine with Xi at the 2022 meeting or not is immaterial. In any case, the overall goal made very clear in the joint statement a redistribution of power in the world, an end to American domination and a redefinition of democracy and human rights. Henceforth, the government is free to interpret them in its own way. But in a geopolitical confrontation where the winner takes all, trouble in Ukraine 
or the Middle East is a victory for China. Both conflicts drain US resources and attention. Both disrupt the status quo. If the US engages in Israeli retaliation against Hamas in the Gaza Strip, its alliances with the Arab states of the Arabian Peninsula will be tested and new opportunities will open up for Xi. So just as Putin immediately placed the blame for Hamas's horrific attack on Israeli civilians on the US, so too did China, and not only failed to condemn Hamas, but criticized Israel for its circular vouching and collective punishment of all Palestinians by flattering the Muslim world in this way. Putin and Xi are cementing their success in the so-called Global South by convincing countries that the problem is not Russian actions or the gruesome atrocities of Hamas, but the ongoing colonialism of the US and Europe. And this rhetoric works because nothing angers ordinary Arabs more than the unjust fate of Palestine, with its colonial overtones and centuries-long struggle for dominion over the Holy Land. So expect Xi and Putin to lash out against the West again. They may have incurred some economic costs and Russia some military ones, but they have been quite successful in luring other countries to their side. Mark Champion is a Bloomberg columnist.